Let's continue with uh, Revelation. We're now in chapter 9. We're still dealing with the continuation of the seven angels that are standing before God that have the seven trumpets that were sounding the seven trumpets. These judgments are judgments that are directly uh, at the command of God. The seven seals, as we said, uh, that was uh, the seven seals were opened by Christ. And once Christ opened up those seven seals, he's the ones that, that initiated. Right. So Christ is the one that. Is providing salvation during the church age. And then when he, uh, when God says, okay, that's it, close up, <laughs> you know, after the church is raptured away, Christ is the one as the lamb that initiates the process. But we see in Revelation chapter eight and nine, the, the seven angels standing before God with the seven trumpets that are sounding, those judgments are coming directly from God. So with the, the seals, we talked about the first seal, the white horse, we, we most believe it represents the Antichrist spirit, the bow representing peace. And that's how he's able to uh, uh, conquer. And then eventually he begins to uh, conquer naturally, physically with violence, uh, with military power and might. We talked about the second seal, the red horse, uh, bringing forth war and a great sword. We talked about the third seal, bringing the black horse, which represents famine. Right, and he had a, uh, a scale measuring out barley and wheat. We got to the fourth seal when that was open. We got the pale horse, which represents death, right, with both a uh, a demonic individual along with hell as a demonic individual with a personage as well. Uh, and with that came all forms of pestilence and uh, which is all kind of types of diseases uh, and microbes, bacteria plagues like all kinds of locusts or anything like that and along with animals as well animals attacking you you know wild animals snakes everything um we opened up the fifth seal and that was those as a result of the first seals opening up there were souls that were martyred those that knew oh, oh i'm in the tribulation period they gave their lives to christ all right, they received salvation, symbolized by the white robe. The sixth seal opened up. That was that great earthquake. That was a shaking of both heaven and earth. And with that came uh, great darkness as well. Uh, and then they opened up. Then there was a salvation break when there were those that, uh, as a result of all of these things that are going on, um, salvation, the people were, were, were brought in as well. And they accepted uh, Christ believed on him. Then the seventh seal is open and it just gave way to introducing introduction of the seven trumpets, right? And so we have this diagram here of the seven trumpets. The key thing, one of the important things about the, the judgment of the seven trumpets, we said the first four represent the judgment of the thirds, right? And the first through the fifth trumpets always seem to begin with some kind of celestial object or a star coming down to earth, bringing with it judgment. So it opens up with uh, another angel coming uh, with the golden censer filled with inc much incense in the prayers of the saints, right? And then uh, I think coals were put into it as well. And then that's thrown down to the altar. So it's something always, the seven trumpets deal with something coming down directly from heaven, right? Falling from heaven, a celestial event, uh, and with it bringing forth judgment. And then we see when the first trumpet is sound, something comes from heaven again. It's a uh, hell and fire mingle with blood. And it, when it comes down to earth, right, it burns up uh, all of the trees. Well, it burns up a third of the trees, a third of the grass is burned up. So here we see this judgment of the thirds. And here again, we see something coming down from heaven, which is pretty consistent with uh, at least the first, um, well, well, even up to you know, the first, five judgments. We get to the second judgment. There comes this mountain uh, flaming fire that's thrown down into the sea, and that destroys a third of living uh, things that are alive in the sea, along with a third of the ships and things like that, right? And the sea is, a third of the sea is turned to blood, right? Then we see another celestial event happening, or star, or something, meteor, or asteroid, something, falling from the heaven again, like this mountain of fire coming down from the heavens. We have this, uh, this celestial vent like, called wormwood, like some kind of meteor or something. It falls down and, and it poisons a third of the uh, fresh water, right? And makes the water bitter or poisoned, right? 
Uh, and then the fourth trumpet sounds. I think we read that one. And then there's another celestial event. Uh, we dealt with the fourth one. Um, and the, the darkness, the, uh, the sun and the moon and the stars, they lose a third. So all these celestial events bringing forth judgments. We're going to get to the fifth judgment now. Now we're entering into the three woes. So there says there are three woes that are left. And the three woes rep represents the uh, last three judgment of the, of the trumpet judgment. So we're going to look at that. And again, the fifth trumpet, it's also going to begin with another celestial event or a star coming down to heaven. And when it comes down to earth, comes down from heaven to earth, bringing a judgment with it. So let's take a look at it. Now, before I begin reading the judgment um, of everything that has taken place so far from the beginning of the seals, all the way up to where we read so far, and even the seven trumpets and all of the judgment we're going to read, all of this is chronicled in Joel chapter one. I'm going to read through it. My wife is like, whoa, look at all that. <laughs> but uh, I'm going to read through it quickly. And as I read through it, you're going to see what is being described here is everything involving from the opening of the seals all the way through the seven judgments. So I'm going to read through it quickly. Many of us are very familiar with this. Uh, so it's no surprise when I read through this. Joel chapter one, verse one. The word of the Lord came to Joel, the son of Pethuel. Hear this, ye old men, and give ear. All ye inhabitants of the land, have this been in your days or even in the days of your father. So uh, this could be both a pro both prophetic, right? Speaking of the things that are to come, but a lot of it was in place right now, what they were going through. But a, a lot of this was prophecy speaking of the things that were come. And as he's speaking these events that are going to be happening, he's telling them of these prophecies that has been given to him by God, right? He's telling them to the children and to the children, children is like, this is what is coming. Right. There's things going on both now, but things that are going to be coming as well as a judgment that's going to be coming in the land and is going to affect Jerusalem or the nation of Israel. Right. It says, tell your children of it and let your children tell their children and their children another generation. So this thing that was prophesied back in Joel, back in the Old Testament, they are to keep to be remembering the prophecies that are both happening at this time and that are to come. Right. That which the palmer worm have left the half the locust eaten and that which the locust locust have eaten the canker worm eaten that which the canker worm have left the caterpillar eaten awake ye drunkards and weep and how all ye drinkers of wine because the new wine for it is cut off from your mouth right so the these first five verses here speak of the seals that were opened by Christ. The third seal was the famine, which represented the black horse, right? Uh, and the fourth seal represents the pestilence that is spoken of. It's going to bring all kinds of pestilence, pestilence being both like locusts, uh, wild animals and beasts attacking, uh, different types of microbes, bacteria, viruses, all those destruction. And Joel is describing the third and fourth seal that we've already mentioned in Jerusalem that is taking place during the tribulation period. So that's what he's talking about. So this event of the, of the Parma worm, the canker worm, the caterpillar, yes, that happened in the Old Testament, but he's prophesying also of the same event that's going to take place when the pestilence is poured out in the land, not just in Jerusalem as well, but this is going to be throughout the whole world as well. But everything is really centralized to Jerusalem as the center point. Jerusalem is the center point of the world, of the earth, All right? Uh, he goes on, now the fifth angel with the, with the fifth trumpet sounding, he chronicles this here in Joel, starting Joel chapter one, verse six. For a nation is come up. This come up he's talking about is the pit, which we're gonna read uh, in uh, Revelation chapter nine. For a nation is come up from the pit, he's talking about, upon my land, strong and without number, whose teeth, are the teeth of a lion, and he hath the cheek of a great lion. He hath laid, he hath laid my vine waste and bark my fig tree. Fig tree uh, throughout the Old and New Testament always represents, uh, typically represents Israel, but that's another topic here. But uh, he hath made it clean bare, and hath cast it away. The seven branches thereof are made white. Lament like a virgin, gird with, girded with sackcloth for the husband of her youth. 
the meat offering and the drink offering is cut off from the house of the Lord. The priests, the Lord's ministers, mourn. The field is wasted. The land mourneth. The corn is wasted. The new wine is dried up and the oil languishes. And this the language means like lacks vitality or is weak or feeble. Right. Um, and so this is basically what's going on here. Um, Oh, it goes on, uh, verse 11. Be ye ashamed, O ye husbandmen, how, O ye vine dressers, vine dressers, for the wheat and the barley, because the harvest of the field is perished. And so when we looked at, I think it was the, the famine with the scales, it talked about weighing out wheat and weighing out barley, right? So we talked about that. So here we see it's the, those judgments of the, of the four horsemen of the populace is chronicled here as well in Joel, as we see in Revelation, but it's speaking of both present, but also filling prophecy in the tribulation period. The vine is dried up, the fig tree languisheth, the pomegranate tree, the palm tree also, the apple tree, even all the trees of the field are withered because joy is withered away from the sons of men. So when the prophecies were coming forth, and I, I remember telling you guys that when it talked about trees, when I looked up that word trees, it was talking about fruit trees. And that's why uh, I was like, oh, this trees that he's talking about here from that first third of the plague that was talking about fruit trees, right? Later on, it's going to start talking about, and the judgment we're going to read, it's going to talk about all things that are green all together. That's all types of trees. And we're going to read that uh, today as we get into the sixth trumpet, fifth trumpet, as we as we get into the fifth trumpet. Or did we do the fifth? Yeah. As we get into the fifth trumpet, we're going to see how they're going to begin to destroy all green things altogether. But the first third was talking about the fruit trees as chronicled here in Joel chapter one. Verse 13, gird yourselves and lament, ye priests, how ye ministers of the altar come Lie all night in sackcloth, ye ministers of my God, for the meat offering and the drink offering is withholden from the house of your God. So all these things that are being prophesied here is what Israel is going to have to do as part of their repentance, of course, for rejecting Christ and their idolatry, you know, thousands of generations of idolatry, thousands of years of idolatry. This is how, this is the things they're going to have to do before the coming of the Lord. They're humbling themselves in repentance, right? Uh, verse 14, Saint. Sanctify ye a fast, call a solemn assembly, gather the elders and all the inhabitants of the land into the house of the Lord your God and cry unto the Lord. Uh, verse 15, alas, for the day, the day of the Lord is at hand at, and as a destruction from the Almighty it shall come. So this is what we're reading in Revelation chapter 9, that Joel is prophesying of the things that are to come and what the nation of Israel must do in order to, uh, for the day of the Lord to come. Uh, for their redemption, that is, right? His judgment is upon them, but they, they're going to have to repent and sanctify a fast and call upon the Lord. And as soon as they begin to do that, they're going to say, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. The Lord will be right there, right? Verse 16, is not the meat cut off before our eyes? Yea, joy and gladness from the house of our God. The seed is rotten in their clots. The garners are laid desolate. The barns are broken down for the corn is withered. How do the beasts groan? The herds of the cattle are perplexed because they have no pasture. Yea, the flocks of the sheep are made desolate. O Lord, to thee will I cry, for the, the fire have devoured the pastures of the wilderness, and a flame hath burned all the trees of the field. The beasts of the field cry also unto thee, for the rivers of the waters are dried up. The fire have devoured the pastures of the wilderness. So we're going to read as we get into the rest of the seven trumpets, the judgments of seven trumpets is going to be describing these things here that I'm talking about here, about how the fire is going to destroy everything, um, how everything's going to be laid desolate. Uh, you know, it's this uh, scriptures talked about. It was like Eden before this beast, these uh, armies, uh, the demonic armies taking over the land like Garden of Eden before them, but behind them is going to be like a desolate wasteland. Uh, he's describing, Joel's describing events that are going to be coming, and it's just a terrible thing. Uh, he goes on for a few more verses in Joel chapter 2. Blow ye the trumpet in Zion, sound and alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord cometh, for it is nigh at hand. A day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness, as the morning spread upon the mountains, a great people and a strong. There 
hath not been ever like, neither shall be any more after it, even to the years of many generations. So he's talking about the day of gloominess and darkness, uh, the judgments that we're going to continue on, they're going to be made manifest. There's going to be lots of darkness, things coming up out of the pit, right? Uh, and demons being released out of the Euphrates rivers and, and you know, uh, great armies going to be coming, uh, just killing people. And he's talking about these events that are going to be happening. Uh, when he gets to um, Joel chapter 2, verse 3, it's the sixth angel sounding uh, that he's talking about here. A fire devoureth before them, and behind them a flame burneth. The land is as the Garden of Eden before them, and behind them a desolate wilderness. Yea, and nothing shall escape him. The appearance of them is as the appearance of horses, as horsemen, and as horsemen. So shall they run, like the noise of chariots on the mountain tops. Shall they leap like the noise of a flame of fire that devoureth the stubble as a strong people set in battle array before their face, the people shall be much pain. All faces shall gather blackness. They shall run like mighty men. They shall climb the wall like men of war. They shall march everyone on his ways. They shall not break ranks. Neither shall one thrust another. That just means that uh, they just move on their way. You can't move them. You can't kill them. They're not going to turn from their destruction. You can't distract them. Neither shall one thrust another. They shall walk everyone in his path. And when they shall fall on the sword, they shall not be wounded. They shall run to and fro in the city. They shall run upon the walls. They shall climb up upon the houses. They shall enter in at the windows like a thief. The earth shall quake before them. The heavens shall tremble. The sun and the moon shall be dark and the stars withdraw their shining. That's one of the other judgments that's going to be poured out when we finish up the seven trumpets as well. All right. And the Lord shall utter his voice for his army, for his camp is very great. These are demonic army he's talking about that he's releasing to do his bidding as a as a judgment. For he for he is strong that executed his word for the day of the Lord is great and very terrible. Who can abide it? That was another question that was asked. Who can abide this? That's the 144,000 can abide. There also now saith the Lord, turn ye even to me with all your heart and with fasting, with weeping and with mourning. So that's what Israel's going to have to do. Fast, weep and mourn. You know, uh, rend your hearts and not your garments and turn to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, so to anger and of great kindness and repenteth him of the evil. So he'll turn from the judgment that's coming against uh, those if they will repent. Who knoweth if he will return and repent and leave a blessing behind him, even a meat offering and a drink offering unto the Lord your God. Blow the trumpet in Zion, sanctify a fast, call a solemn assembly, gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children and those that suck the breast. Let the bridegroom go forth of his chamber and the bride out of her closet. Let the priests, the ministers of the Lord, weep between the porch and the altar. And let them say, spare thy people, O Lord, and give not thine heritage to report, to reproach that the heathen should rule over them. Wherefore should they say among the people, where is their God? Then will the Lord be jealous for his land and pity his people. Yea, the Lord will answer and say unto his people, Behold, I will send you corn and wine and oil. So that wine and oil that we keep talking, reading about, that's representing the 144,000. They are symbolized as that wine and oil that's going to be given to them. When they begin to cry out, he's going to send the 144,000, the wine and the oil, and he's going to be able to deliver them. Right with the teaching of the gospel, the preaching of Christ as their Messiah, to turn to the Messiah. They're the ones that are going to be telling them to repent and to call the fast and to gather the solemn assembly, to escape all these things, call upon Jesus, right? He's the one. And I will no more make you a reproach among the heathen. I'm going to stop there. But all of this, these events we're reading in Revelation so far are all included in Joel chapter 1 and chapter 2. Uh, but without the indications of the uh, seven seals and the four horsemen of the apocalypse and uh, the seven judgments, it's just all combined in there together, chronicled. So now you get to see the the pain, agony, and suffering and the absence of uh, no food, no water, hot sun. You know, I mean, it's it's a terrible thing, you know, what's going on here. All right, so let's get into Revelation chapter 9 so we can see uh, further what Joel is speaking of. So it says here, uh, And the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven unto earth, and to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. So here again we see this recurring theme 
uh, some kind of celestial or heavenly event occurring, but being now coming down to earth and with it comes judgment, right? Um, and so this star falling from heaven, does this represent an angel? We know that uh, stars uh, in Revelation so far could have, have been represented as um, pastors and things like that, but also stars often uh, represents uh, an angel. For example, here in Luke chapter 10, verse 18, Jesus was speaking. He said, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. Right. And so, um, and here in uh, Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12, it says, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which did weaken the nation? So here we see an example of Lucifer, who is uh, an angel, all right? Uh, we know that he was fallen, uh, and he was uh, sent down uh, to earth as well. So you know, many uh, feel that, I can't say many, but... Um, there are those that do feel that this example of a star falling from heaven does represent uh, an angel, uh, specifically, actually, Lucifer. Uh, and I, I am easily convinced of this as well, uh, unless someone also can, I can be convinced, of course, that this could represent something else as well. But definitely, it says a star, I saw a star fall from heaven. Now, we've seen many other types of celestial events happening as well. One was a mountain with fire. Uh, one was a warm wood, uh, like a, some kind of celestial object as well, coming down from heaven as well, uh, which is some type of stars. We've seen stars, natural stars, fall from heaven as well. Uh, but um, we know that this is actually is someone something that has personage, because it says, I saw a star, a star fall from heaven unto earth, and to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. So it uses the him here. So this him represents uh, an actual person, right? Um, so this could represent either an angel then from heaven, right? Or it could represent a like an angel meaning like um, one of the other angels that are up there with the seven trumpets or the other angel that was casting down the golden censer and stuff like that. But I don't believe that that's that type of angel uh, that is referred to as a hymn uh, because it doesn't say like an, another angel or something like that. Uh, so I, I'm of the opinion. Oh, uh, Hyacinth asks, well, uh, if this is Satan, why would he be given the key to the bottomless pit? That's a good question too, because I was thinking about that uh, that as well. Um, so it says, uh, well, I'll just, get, I'll just go through the notes and we'll get to that. Thank you, Hyacinth. Um, I saw a star far from heaven unto earth. So here we see this theme of something, a judgment falling down, something being cast down from heaven, down to earth, bringing forth judgment that comes along with it. And this hymn that we're talking about uh, put here, it has personage to it. So it is not like a natural star, right? Like a celestial star, like a planet or an asteroid or something like that. It is an actual personage, right? Um, and it doesn't use the phrase like when another angel appears, like we've seen in uh, the other parts of Revelation chapter eight, when it's referring to the same type of angel, uh, to say like, I saw another angel, an angel meaning like uh, an angel similar to what he was already seeing up in heaven, standing before the seven, the seven angels standing before the throne of God. Here, it doesn't say like another angel like that. He says, I saw a star far from heaven and to him is given bonus. So we know it is an angel now. Uh, but it is, I do believe it's like a fallen angel, right? And I, I'm of the opinion that this could represent Satan as well, but I could be convinced otherwise with someone who is astute in the, in the word as well. Now, the question is, why would this uh, angel be given uh, a key? So that I, I don't know, but it evidently means that this, this, this angel uh, that fell had to be given authority. He does not have the authority or access to do it. Uh, it was given to him to be able to do it. Now, this is not uncommon because God has complete authority over everything. And everything that we see taking place, it is because the authority has been given. Power has been given to it. 
when we went through and looked at uh, the four horsemen of the apocalypse that is given, it was everything kept saying uh, it was given to them to do that, given to them to do this, given to them to do that, but then also commanded not to do this and not to do that. So this angel that has fallen has limited ability, but the ability that is given has been allowed by God to do destruction. So if this angel that has fallen does represent Satan, God has allowed Satan, then if this angel represents fallen, this fallen star uh, that has given the personage him, if this represents Satan, then God allowed this fallen angel, uh, well, this angel that has fallen to earth from heaven, right, the key to have access to open it up to fulfill a judgment. So here we see this theme of things falling from heaven to earth and with it given uh, authority to bring forth a judgment, right? Now, the key that is given is the key to the bottomless pit. So this bottomless pit, I'm thinking like it represents hell, right? That's what I'm thinking, you know? There's two types of um, things that, uh, or there's two things that appears to have a history of holding demons. One is hell. You know, one is a lake of fire, right, which is mentioned later on. Uh, and there is also like some kind of abyss that we're going to read about in the river Euphrates. And that's part of the seven trumpets, seven trumpet judgments as well. Uh, but, you know, I'm warning, does this represent hell? Right. Um, so the, uh, a key is given to this angel that has fallen from heaven. Uh, and this angel is allowed to access the pit, bottomless pit. And we're going to see it's going to allow demon demons to come forth out of that, right? Uh, the other thing I mentioned was that there is something called the lake of fire, which Satan is temporarily imprisoned in in Revelation chapter 19, verse 20. And he's going to be later released from uh, the lake of fire, the lake of fire in Revelation chapter 20, verse 7. And then he's going to be permanently put back in when you read Revelation chapter 20, verse 10. Right. But I don't think this is referring to the lake of fire as a bottomless pit. I think this actually may represent, uh, likely represents hell. It has some features that we describe hell as having, which is like fire and brimstone and stuff like that. So that's why I'm more inclined to think that this may represent uh, hell. Uh, those that have a, a different understanding of it, I'm more than willing to entertain and be convinced uh, as well. Because uh, there's so many different thoughts on here. Uh, verse 2, it says, And he opened the bottomless pit, and there arose a smoke out of the pit, as the smoke of a great furnace. And the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. All right, so here, once he opened up the, the pit, so it set a he on it, so this star that fell is, is, is a parsonage. And typically, again, I keep repeating this, we typically don't speak of a godly divine angels that are obeying the word of God, we typically don't use the phrase fallen as it relates to them. Uh, there's a tendency to, re to associate uh, an angel that has fallen to be of a demonic um, origin or Satan or something like that. Uh, but we don't associate the angels that work with, that are obedient to God as fallen. We don't typically put that label associated that that phrase or label with them all right so that's why so it's either some kind of demon uh in my opinion possibly or satan himself right uh and it says that but whatever it is he had the key and he opened up that key and he let out things that were in the bottomless pit and when he opened it up it says arose a great smoke and we often see that smoke is associated with judgment right we're going to see how when the um Babylon, when we get to the end of Revelation, uh, when this judgment uh, occurs, a great smoke is present, right? We know that when Sodom and Gomorrah was destroyed, great smoke was present, right? And so smoke is often associated with judgment here. And here we see that the judgment that's coming from the fallen star that comes to earth that opens up the bottomless pit brings a judgment upon the earth as well, right? And that judgment is first symbolized as smoke. and then Associated again with this smoke is the darkening of heavens and darkening of the sky. And that's a theme that we see occurring in the seven judgments, but not just in the seven judgments, even with um, 
some of the seals as well, that there's a darkening of the sky or or loss. I think some of the earlier seals, there was a, a, a one third of the sun lost his light, a third of the moon lost the light, and the stars lost their light. So again, we see with these judgments that keep occurring, there is this darkness, darkening of the heavens and the sky and the celestial beings, or just always a continuing more darkness associated with. So always part of the judgment that's coming upon the earth with the seven judgments is just even more darkness. Not that there wasn't enough darkness, now there's even more darkness that's coming. Verse three says, and there, oh, it says that the sun uh, as the smoke of a great furnace. So that's why I was wondering like, okay, well, this picture that they're talking about uh, this sounds a lot like hell. Hell was spoken of often as some kind of a great furnace, right? Um, burning furnace, right? And when this furnace is opened up, this smoke comes out. I'm like, yeah, that kind of sounds like hell forever, you know? Um, seeing descriptions of hell or heard about this, um, the writings uh, in the Bible about hell. But when that furnace was opened up, Right, and the smoke came out. The sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. So again, as we said, uh, with the judgments keep coming, the loss keeps coming darkness, um, both in the physical sense, right? But then also there's a darkness that's going to come uh, in the spiritual sense as well. So the sun and the air and the air were darkened because of the smoke that comes out of the pit. Right. Verse three it says, uh, and there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth. And to them was given power as the scorpions of the earth have power. All right, so uh, when that um, pit is opened up and the smoke rises out, bringing forth a judgment, which is the darkening of the sun in the air, then out of the smoke comes a bunch of locusts. And of course the locusts come upon the earth. So the judgment that's coming forth is a judgment that is of coming upon the earth. It says, unto them was given power as the scorpions of the earth have power. So here again, we see this phrase um, was given, meaning that every God is in control of everything and he is uh, given permission to demons to have their reign and rule. So even this angel that has fallen from heaven to earth, he has been given um, authority to do what he needs to do. Uh, the uh, the white the the white horse, the one that sits upon the white horse, uh, he's given power, right? Uh, death and hell, they're given power. Every they don't have anything unless God gives them the ability and the authority to do that. And so here, even these locusts uh, that come up out of the pit and the smoke, they have to be given power as well. And so God allows that, you know, why would he allow that? <laughs> because it's part of the judgment that he's bringing out upon them, right? So God has all authority and he allows that. My One of the things I always wondered is that Peter, uh, in Second Peter uh, chapter two, verse four, we're gonna read some things as we continue in Revelation chapter nine. He's, um, Peter's gonna talk about that there's going to be, um, demons that are going to be chained in the river Euphrates, right? Um, and here we see Peter and, and here we see that there are actually demons that are in hell that are going to be released as well. So I'm also wondering, like when Peter was talking about here in, P in Second Peter chapter 2, verse 4, he says, For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness, to be reserved unto judgment, I'm wondering is, hey, are some of these um, these uh, angels that sinned and he cast them down to hell, is that part of these demons that are being released now, right? Bringing forth uh, judgment, right? It says reserved unto judgment. Um, now, is that part of this judgment? We know that judgment is ultimately referring to the judgment they're going to have to face before God and they're going to be cast to the lake of fire and they're just in this holding abyss right now. But I was wondering, like, hmm, I wonder if this pit here that's being opened up, though some of those angels that have been put in there, right, are these some of these angels that are being, demons that are being released right now out of this pit here that we see that is also bringing forth like a great furnace and smoke is coming up as well. 
And then when uh, we read one of the judgments that is to come about some angels in the Euphrates rivers being bound, I'm wondering if that's like, hmm, uh, are this part of those that are chained as well? You know, I don't know. Uh, it is probably not, but just I just ponder, just wondering, you know, I wonder if could these also be released as part of a judgment uh, as well, a judgment unto them as well, right? That when you let them out, they're going to do exactly what um, if God allowed them to do what they would do, that this is what they would do. And that's also part of their judgment, you know, that they all they want to do is kill, destroy and murder and stuff like that. And that's part of part of their judgment as well. Um, I don't know. I have no idea, but just kind of throwing that out there. It's just part of a of, of some of the scriptures that intrigue me related to this as well. So they have, to them was given power as power of scorpions, as the scorpions of the earth have power. And we're going to see how that's basically is going to be uh, to sting men. It goes on and says, and it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree, but only those men which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. Uh, so here, um, again, they are under the control of God, and God has commanded these lo these. Uh, did it say locusts? What does it say there? Oh, God has uh, has commanded these locusts, right? Uh, that they are not to hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green tree nor any tree. Now, if you know what locusts are naturally, you would say, well, that's completely contrary to what locusts do. Locusts they eat grass of the earth. Locusts, they eat anything that is green and they eat any tree. You're like, that's completely contrary to the nature of what a locust is and what a, what a locust eats. Well, that's because these are not natural locusts, right? Uh, so it kind of begs to differ that we know that these are demons, right? Um, and yeah, that's what, but why would they, and they have power to sing, right? Why would they want to even, because they're not natural locusts, why would they not, why would they hurt the grass of the earth, any green thing or any tree? Because these are spiritual things as well, right? Well, that's because these demons, when demons are let loose, when demons are let loose, these ones that have been bound up, these demons were so fierce that they would have destroyed all of creation if God had not bound them and stuff like that. And so, although they've been given power as scorpions to sting men, right, God had to command them. The only to do that kind of pun or judgment because these types of demons that have been bound up in hell that God has separated light from darkness, right? They'll destroy everything on earth, you know? Um, and some even believe that, uh, that that may have been part of why the earth was without form of void at the beginning of the creation. But that is, um, that could be perhaps the uh, conjecture and stuff like that, that he had to actually bind them up when he uh, brought forth uh, the new vegetation on earth and, and, and brought order uh, to the earth and stuff like that and brought the land forth and separated the waters from the land and all those things that he had to bind them up. Otherwise they would just bring forth this same type of destruction again. So these, these locusts that were brought forth, they were, had the ability to destroy grass and any green thing and any tree. Right. So he limit their ability to only just to perform a judgment of torturing men by stinging them. So when it uses this word, when you look up this word, uh, hurt not the grass of the earth, that grass that he's talking about is a general phrase for all vegetation. Right. And when he, the other judgment that came forth, it says, and they hurt a third of the, uh, when hell fell down and destroyed a third of the green things, that's talking about just vegetation. We think of grass, we're thinking of just like our grass that we have in our front lawn or just, it's talking about just vegetation, you know, like low height vegetation altogether. Then that's why it clarifies also uh, neither any tree. So that's a different, that's more like uh, big trees and stuff like that, right? Um, and then it says neither any green thing at all altogether because there is another judgment that's coming. It's gonna ravish, it's gonna ravish everything. But again, as we said before, the judgments of the seven trumpets, it starts out in um, what I call exponential. It starts out with a third and then continues to get greater and greater. So eventually it leads to the full bowls of wrath of God. Right, which you're going to see toward the end of the judgments is going to get worse 
and worse and worse and worse, affecting more and more things. So he is, God is in his mercy, is measuring out judgment and in incremental, hoping to bring people to a place of repentance and salvation, right? Uh, but then he goes on, he says, telling these, commanding these locusts that's coming out of the pit, uh, but only hurt not the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree, but only those men which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. So basically saying, do not hurt the 144,000. 144,000 are going to be out preaching, right? Uh, bringing salvation and deliverance uh, across the world. He's telling these, uh, these locusts that have power like scorpions to sting men that they are not to touch or to do anything uh, with the 144,000, only sting those that do not have the seal of God in their foreheads or those that have, you know, not, not repented, stuff like that. So uh, not those with the seal of God, meaning the unrepentant transgressors, what he's talking about. That's the judgment coming upon them, right? So the ones that have the seal of God, as we said before, those represents 144,000. Those are the ones that said uh, previously in the scripture, it said, hurt not the oil and the wine, speaking to, I believe it was the black horse. The seal is, oh, uh, someone wrote, the seal is the love of God. Um, all right, um, so I'm going pull to that, pull that out. I think it may have been like, uh, maybe Pastor Ballard. Pastor Ballard, the seal is the love of God and the Holy Ghost. Okay, so I'm glad I needed clarity on that about uh, I've always wanted to say it represent, uh, definitely I want to say represents the Holy Ghost. Uh, however, right, um, it's hard to convince pe people of, of that. And I think that's what the oil and the wine is representing. Uh, the, the oil and the wine represents the 144,000, but it represents what they have with them. They have that oil which represents the Holy Ghost, and they have that wine, which represents the, uh, the gospel, which brings joy and gladness and salvation and healing, right? And so I'm glad that I have been wanting to say that, but I'm just like, ah, uh, you know, don't have anyone else, no one ever says it, but, or even is aware of, that's what that oil, when it says, for not the oil and the wine, I said that represents the 144,000. Um, and that oil is speaking of the anointing oil, you know, that brings healing. So that's why I said healing. So the oil and the healing that I put in there represents that, uh, represents the oil or represents the Holy Ghost, right? That gives them the power to be able to stand. Remember, I have this last verse here where scripture said, ended, I think, in maybe uh, Revelation chapter four, who shall be able to stand, right? And then, it, and then the next verse, next chapter begins with, uh, he saw 144,000 named of the different 12 tribes. Those are the ones that will be able to stand because they have the oil, that is the anointing of the Holy Spirit. They have the wine, which is the gospel of uh, Christ, right? And the salvation that comes through the Lamb, receiving that message, right? And because of that, it brings them joy, right? So all of that together, that's what, who, this, who this group represents. All right, I'm going to pause Right here, I'm going to stop. You don't want me to stop here, but I'm going to pause it right here. And tomorrow, we're going to finish up. Um, we're going to we're going to we're going to finish up leaving off from Revelation chapter nine, verse four. We're going to try to move quickly to get some more of the more of the details that deal with the rest of the judgments of the seven trumpets. Uh, Hyacinth.